Good morning, and thank you for joining us at the Princeton Public Library's Virtual Local Author Day. We're so pleased that you could join us. My name is Nora, and I'm part of the programming team. Our Local Author Day features presenters here on Crowdcast, networking hours on Zoom, and a virtual author and publisher fair. You can find information on all of these by clicking on the green button below the video. We hope you'll take some time, especially to visit our author and publisher fair to perhaps find your next read. You'll also find some author readings of their own work and perhaps a special offer or two. This morning's presentation is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing at the same link here on Crowdcast. This morning, I'm very pleased to be joined by fellow librarian and travel writer, Margaret Montet. Uh, most writers are able to narrate a linear story, but the trick to adding reader interest is weaving in relevant memoir, research, conversation, and anecdotes. Think of the narrative as a bracelet and these additions as its charms. Our presenter is a librarian for more than 20 years and a travel writer herself. She's the author of the forthcoming Nerd Traveler, a collection of travel essays. And her presentation will offer you tips for efficient online and print research using library resources and help you integrate new threads into the fabric of your narrative. We're so pleased you're all here with us today and please join me in welcoming Margaret up to the screen. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for that introduction, Nora. You did some research. Uh, <laughs> as a librarian would, I think. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk to you for a minute or two before I share my screen. I do have a PowerPoint. It's mostly filled with pictures though. Um, I wanted to tell you about where this idea came from. And it was um, a piece I had to write when I was working on my MFA, my Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing, and I did nonfiction. And I had to I had to write a piece of creative writing, but I also had to write something about writing, like a college paper, right? And so a friend of mine came into the office, my office, my librarian office, and he was talking about an advanced degree he was working on and how he was using a, a visual model to describe his topic. And his topic was, a, a, you know, an educational leadership kind of thing, which started out wide and then got focused and focused and focused. So he used a wedding cake. So the bottom level of the, of, or the bottom layer of the wedding cake was the, the, the wide view of the topic. So the institutional, and then the next layer was the, let's say the departmental and then the small area, and then maybe just the course. And it was talking about, um, accreditation and all that sort of thing. But anyway, I thought about that and I said, I wonder if I could come up with a visual model for my paper. That would really make it unique and stand out from the other students. So I was driving to work the next day. And you know that's where you get the best ideas is when you're driving and when you're in the shower, when you have no paper or pencil to write them down. But I'm driving to work and I looked at my wrist and I was just wearing one of these. I wasn't wearing both. I feel like a dancer or something. But I looked and I said, oh, a bracelet. That's what I'll use. So the bracelet itself, the links, that is the through line, the linear story has to be there somewhere. And then all the charms, those are the little things that you're going to add to it. And then I kept thinking about it, kept thinking, I said, oh, there's certain kinds of kinds of charms that I want to add, such as research and anecdote and memoir. And you know, there, there are many, many infinite amount, but those are the ones that I chose for my paper. And I've just been using this, not for everything I write, but you know, I I tell people about it and they enjoy it and you know kind of breaks through so you might not have this vis visually apparent in your finished piece but it's a great way to get it started so let me start sharing my screen and i can show you my oh it went away again oh 
Oh my gosh. All right. Nora, do you see my PowerPoint? It's not up at the moment. All right. Okay, let me close this. All right, for some reason it's not giving me the option to show the thing I want to show. Let me get back out of there, come back here. <sighs> we just ran through this and made it work and now it's like we didn't. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll try this. No, no, it doesn't have it either. Oh, this is so weird. It's giving me a document that has nothing to do with this or my own face. What's, what's going on? Share screen. No. All right. Thanks for bearing with us, folks. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be running in just a moment. It's not my fault. All right. I'm just going to play around here, see if I can bring this up again. All right. Now come back to you. Oh, there it is. How's it looking? Um, it's on the, we have yep. the... Good. That's the right answer. Now, okay. how's it looking? Perfect. Aha! Aha! We figured it out. See, one of the things about speaking is don't lose your cool. You just try things. Okay. So, here's my screen. That's where it starts, but I'm going to move in. I have a long background of writing researchy articles for various different things. And maybe 20 years ago, I started writing about travel destinations. I thought that was super fun for a while. And my favorite place to write about is Cape May. That's where I'm from. I was born down there and we still own a house. I own it with my sister's grown children and we go there a lot. And um, yeah, so I started writing about Cape May and some general kinds of articles. Um, I wrote for families. I wrote for brides. Beach weddings are really big. I wrote an article for RVers, for World War II buffs, for photographers. You name it. I wrote an article for them. I had the the great fortune of writing for the little magazine that the Kate May Lewis Ferry gives out. Um, it used to be done by an advertising agency and then it switched and switched. And I think it's done in house now. And I don't, I haven't written for it for a long time, but that was so great because they would, they would use my ideas and they would give me ideas. That's where the wedding thing came from. But anyway, I wrote about Kate May and I wrote about the places that I went and I started getting tired of writing that nuts and bolts, where to go, where to eat, what to see, where to sleep, all that. I got tired of that. And I wanted to do something more literary. And so I went to get my MFA in nonfiction. And that's, you know, fast forward, like, you know, two and a half years. And then I was thinking about the, the visual model. And there's my bracelet. And... Ta-da! So, I'm going to ask you to write something. I'm giving you three minutes. So, you know, just kind of think about a trip, a place, or a situation. This presentation was originally the charms of travel writing, but Nora suggested, oh, why don't you just make it the charms of writing? And I thought, oh, yeah. But some of my slides kind of veer into the travel, but that's okay. So maybe you want to write about a place you went. Great. 
Where did you go? Who did you go with? What was unique about the place or situation? Just write a quick through line. Maybe you're writing fiction and maybe one of your characters is going on a trip. Or maybe you just want to write about a situation, fiction or nonfiction. It doesn't have to be exotic. It could be a local park or the beach, someplace, you know, that you've been recently or, or someplace that you haven't been much. And then we'll add to that during this workshop. So I'm going to give you three minutes and just go ahead and write something quickly. I'm not going to make you share it. You can if you want to. But just think about what, think about like a timeline. I, I went to this place with my friend. Did something amazing happen at the airport? We took a cab. We went to the hotel. We walked around the city. And we did that all week long. And then we went back to the airport and flew home, right? You don't have to populate it with all kinds of interesting things those are going to be your charms so you just want to get the very basics in there maybe you're gonna <clears throat> write about something other than a trip or a place i have an idea in my head to write about trips i haven't taken you know a trip that got canceled or a place where Suddenly, they're having some kind of unrest, and I wasn't comfortable going, so we decided to go somewhere else instead, or a pandemic happened, and everything got canceled, and I wouldn't have been comfortable traveling anyway, so you can think about that. Any kind of Any kind of idea for a story. You've got about a minute left. I won't talk if you need quiet. Okay, hold on to that. We'll add to it throughout the workshop. And I'll talk to you about the research charm. We won't do this one in the workshop. It's a little difficult to do research, but I'll tell you all the different ways. This is a great way to add depth and sophistication to your, to your piece. And I like to divide research into two main types. The purposeful research, which is, you know, what I teach students every day how to do, where you go to the library or a database or a book, whatever you've got. You look in the index, you look in the table of contents, and you look for information that's relevant to what you want to talk about. Um, Yeah, so the li think library. I don't like to say that now during pandemic. Uh, Princeton is open, but but my library isn't. So, but anyway, the purposeful kind. The other is the accidental, and this will make it clear. 
um, if you go somewhere and you go on a tour, that tour guide might tell you something. If they're a good tour guide, they'll they'll tell you the main facts that they're supposed to tell you, but they'll they'll also tell you interesting factoids and tidbits and things. Museums, you can learn so much from museums, uh, from your reading. Oh, look at that. I that I want to mention that in my story because that's perfect. Maybe you find something that relates to a character you've got. Or sometimes it's just serendipity. I can't tell you how many times I'm working on something and it's at home in my notebook and I see something else and it fits right in. So, oh, I have to add that. So that's research too, because it's outside of what I already knew. I'm showing you a, a piece of my charm bracelet there. The little owl is actually on the top of a book, which is on top of a stack of books, which I had to have that charm, obviously. Okay. So I have two examples of research. One is where I did research and one is where I didn't do research. And this first one relates to a trip I took to Vienna. I was there for two weeks for an educational purpose, the MFA I told you about. And during that time, I went, you know, I had all kinds of lectures and, and writing things that I had to go to. So in my free time, which wasn't a lot, I managed to see Mozart's house, which is uh, actually an apartment kind of setup. I went to see that and I went to see Johann Strauss II's house. He's the Waltz King, right? And I, I got great information, just like I just said, you know, you go to a museum and you find out all kinds of interesting things. The museums were very different and I use that in the essay as well. But then I got home and I said, oh, Beethoven, the, the essay is supposed to be about the music of Vienna and I don't really have anything special about Beethoven and he's really my favorite, but I just didn't have time to go to the Beethoven Museum. Well, let me do some, some scholarly research, I said to myself, and I did. I went to one of the academic databases thinking, I don't know, I've been studying Beethoven most of my life. I don't know if I'm going to find anything here that I don't know already. Well, ha, 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 I did. I found out by doing this purposeful scholarly research that the orchestras that Beethoven used in Vienna to play his music were really crummy. The money that the aristocracy and the monarchs used to spend on music had dried up. The monarchy was drying up too, but that's another story. But poor Beethoven would have this orchestra that belonged to a theater and maybe it didn't pay well. So if the musicians found better jobs, they'd go to the other job and send a sub who would be usually subpar to Beethoven's orchestra. And it was just awful. So Beethoven, Beethoven himself, the master of symphonies. So I thought, well, that's really interesting. And the whole thing, this, this research turned out to be a conversation over decades between these scholars who were studying this phenomenon of the crummy orchestras. So that just went into my essay. I thought it was so fascinating. So now I had interesting stuff about Beethoven, who's right in the middle of Mozart and Strauss, where I went to their houses and I had different kinds of information. So to me, that was really interesting. I don't know. We'll see when the book comes out if people think it's interesting. Anyway, so I didn't do research when my group went to Montserrat. We were staying in Barcelona, so busy. This was the year I graduated, so I had to present the charms of travel writing craft essay, but I also had to read from my dissertation, my thesis, which is the book that's coming out in July. And I was just so busy getting everything ready and, and trying to get to Mozart's house and Strauss's house, blah, 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 blah. So I asked the leader, so what are we gonna see in Montserrat? Because I didn't research it. And I'm embarrassed because I called my book Nerd Traveler because I'm such a nut about doing research and learning languages and learning the culture and all that. So here I am, Nerd Traveler, and I'm asking the leader, 
So what are we going to see? She said, oh, it's beautiful, this mountain. You can see why they call it Montserrat, because it looks like a serrated knife. And we're going to do it. We're going to look at the stuff, and then we're going to take a hike up the mountain. And it's an easy walk. I'm going to do it in my flip-flops. And she showed me her foot in her flip-flops. And I said, oh, okay. And if you look at the picture that's on the lower left, there's a little cross. That's where the people were hiking to. And you can see little peoples there. I don't know if those are my classmates and colleagues and whatnot, but there they are. There's some people there. I got about halfway up. I like to think it was halfway up. It probably wasn't even. And, you know, I have this borderline asthma that I never even think about. And I just, I can't do this. It was really steep and long. So I went back down and I went into the gift shop and I bought one of those little books that touristy places have and i sat on a bench and i read it and that's where i found out oh my gosh la moraneta is a medieval statue of um, mary holding jesus and it over the years it's carved out of wood and it turned really dark so they call it the black madonna and people come from everywhere to see this artifact and you know i love middle ages history medieval history i would have been in that line if i had researched this place but no i thought i was going to do a hike uphill what was i thinking anyway that was the cautionary tale do your research because there could be a medieval artifact waiting for you so that's montserrat beautiful place though my gosh all right so I'm going to move on. Oh, 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 wait, I have to tell you this. I, thinking that not everybody here would be a nonfiction or travel writer, I did a little research into books that contain these charms that I'm writing about. And the one that I'm thinking of is for research is City of Thieves. I just finished this, David Benioff. And it talks about these two guys walking around in the siege of Leningrad, which was a horrible time for Russia. And what they're trying to do is find a dozen eggs for one of the officers. And the whole book is them traveling around. So it's kind of like, if you think of Scooby-Doo, the cartoon and how the kids would get in the car with Scooby or, or not the car, the van, and they drive around and they're trying to solve a mystery and all these things happen to them. Those are their charms. Well, it's the same thing with City of Thieves. It was a fascinating book, just the way this horrible time turns into a romp. But anyway, at the end, he tells you where he did his research. So here's a piece of fiction in which the author did research and tells you kind of as an extended citation. This is where I found all my information to make sure I got it all right. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the culture charm next. And that's a charm, I was so happy to find this. That's Johann Strauss II, the Waltz King. That's the famous monument to him, the famous statue in the state park in Vienna. And oh boy, was I so excited to find that. Now, when I say culture, I mean not what you learned in social studies about a country in seventh grade. No, that can figure in there too. But in my mind, I'm thinking about art, music, architecture, language, um, literature, traditions, folklore, natural features of the place, all of this stuff adds interest. So how could I talk about Vienna without talking about Johann Strauss, right? So, oh yeah, Vienna. Okay, here's the state park. This is a great, for my essay is on all music. Here's Bruckner. So today, if you go to an orchestra concert, you're likely to hear a Bruckner symphony. Well, back in the day when he was composing, he was just the country bumpkin guy. They had Brahms and they thought he was so fancy and so sophisticated. So yeah, Bruckner got a statue in the park, but it looks like he's trying to climb over a wall, you know, because he just wasn't appreciated. 
you know, the Rodney Dangerfield of Viennese music. And Schubert, look what he gets. He's up on a pedestal. Molly Malone in Dublin. She's even fictional and she gets a statue, which is so popular, it has become a meeting place. Right? We went on a bus tour to Northern Ireland and the organizer said, oh, meet us at the Molly Malone statue. Everybody knows where that is, so we did. So Molly Malone, oh, I don't wanna go back. I wanna tell you about Johann Strauss, the Waltz King. I went to his museum, I got lost. I had the hardest time finding that place. It's not well marked, I'll, t I'll tell you more about that. But for the culture part of this essay, I got to write about all the stuff that was in that museum. His um, piano was there in a big glass box and his violin was there. And there was a lock of his first wife's hair, which I thought was weird because he was married two more times. Plus all the scores and, and posters and broadsides you would expect to see for a composer, all kinds of stuff. It was just fascinating. All right. But the thing about Johann Strauss, he's obviously Vienna's favorite son. And they show you Johann Strauss and portraits almost everywhere. The hotel that I stayed at that I did not select was called the Johann Strauss Hotel. He's just everywhere. He permeates the culture. So I had to talk about him. And every morning in the breakfast room of the hotel and also on the plane that took me away from Austria, Johann Strauss music on continuous loop. So that at the end of the two weeks that I was there, it became a kind of grotesque thing to hear his music, which is a horrible thing to say, but it was, it was, it was permeating my dreams. It was in the background everywhere. So it just, it came to be a strange thing. So that's culture. You know, another thing that I think relates to this culture charm is the idea of a biblio memoir. Have you heard of that genre? It's where you take a book as uh, the basis of a story. And I've done this with uh, Paul Theroux. He writes about traveling and a lot of times traveling by train. So I did a train trip to Pittsburgh, which was, oh, wow, that's a really exotic and far trip. But I did this and I read Paul Theroux and I was, I was thinking about all the things he was talking about, how the people on the train, they're never going to find you. They don't know you're taking notes about them. They don't know who you're a writer. They don't know you can write about them. So, you know, it's just an interesting idea. Biblio memoir fits into the culture. So there are there are books that exist that are just pure biblio memoir, but this could be just a piece of your essay or whatever piece you're writing about. And the fiction book that I thought of to illustrate this is The Enchanted April. It's an oldie from 1922, I think, Elizabeth von Arnim. And I recommend this when people ask me, what should my book club read? I said, oh, you know what? Is it mostly women? How about The Enchanted April? It's a fabulous book. And just thinking that it's 1922 adds this whole other dimension. They go to Italy and they talk about the culture and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, The Enchanted April is a great example of culture, the culture charm and all the different things that the four women, all the different things that they do while they are in Italy. Okay, now let's move on to anecdotes. I have here a picture of the Big Apple. That's a charm on one of my bracelets. And this is so that I remember to tell you about the time I took myself to a concert at Carnegie Hall to hear Schubert. And it occurred to me, well, why don't I do brunch up there too? So th this is the travel writer in me. Okay, what can I do that I can then write about? So I made a reservation for one at the Russian Tea Room, which is, turns out, right next door to Carnegie Hall. I went up there and I sat and there was this couple next to me who, they were just having this conversation 
about this older woman, some kind of aunt that was going to join them. And they're making preparations for her. And they got the waiter to bring them a chair to put at the end of the booth because they weren't sure if she was going to be able to navigate the booth. And they thought, what kind of tea should we get? Maybe we'll wait for her and she can order it. Well, the aunt came in and she didn't want that chair she was fine in the booth she didn't want tea she wants something from the bar and she knew exactly what she wanted and then she took over this ridiculous conversation i already had my notebook out and i was writing stuff because this was just so fun and the trip to the russian tea room actually i think maybe overshadows the part that i wrote about the Schubert concert in Carnegie Hall. You just never know. And when it was time for me to read from my thesis, I picked that Russian tea room part to read to my colleagues. That's how cool it was. You just never know. All right. The other kinds of, of um, anecdotes I add, this is from Mozart's house. I told you I went to visit that. I like to take pictures out of windows, especially of famous people's homes that are now museums. Now, I didn't do it in Mozart's house because I didn't want to get locked up in prison. You weren't supposed to take pictures in there. And I wasn't really taking pictures of it. I was taking picture from it. But I waited till I got outside. So this is actually the front door. But this is what the apartment looks out on. This is the Blutgasse, Blood Alley. And I was told by the docents that this has remained unchanged since Mozart lived there, except for that restroom sign that you see there. And he actually lived in one of the apartments at the end of the street. So I thought, oh, how cool is that? So that's an anecdote. Talk about the Blutgasse and Mozart's apartment. And then, okay, I'm in Prague, and I'm thinking, these buildings are so different. That that church there, all the buildings, and, and you know, they have stories. Oh, Kafka lived here. He lived in a bunch of places in Prague. Anyway, it started to rain. I was there with my sister. It started to rain, and my tour group just demanded a break so they could go and run and buy umbrellas. And my sister and I looked at either, each other like, it's not, it's going to rain for one minute. You can tell by the sky it wasn't going to be a big storm. So I don't know where she went, but I sat down on the curb and just started shooting pictures from that perspective. So if you look at this picture, you can see I'm kind of down low with the camera. And I just love this picture of another tour group with their umbrellas up, kind of forming a a canopy over them and i just thought oh wow and this became one of my favorite pictures of prague so i wrote about that moment where i was sitting on the curb taking pictures it was kind of kind of silly so anyway what i'd like you to do is write some kind of anecdote that relates to the little piece that you wrote in the beginning of this workshop right is there a visual image that you have that goes along with it or that you can create? Is, uh, is there a story about going to a place and getting lost and being really frustrated? Were you next to some people who were ridiculously obsessed with the older lady that was coming to have tea with them. And you took notes. One time I was having lunch, this was back in college, way, way back in, in the gallery in Philadelphia with some friends. And I dropped out of our conversation because I was listening to a conversation behind me that it seemed to me that table was a table full of shoplifters and small time criminals. And I'm telling you, their conversation was way more interesting than my table's conversation. So I, I, you know, I wasn't really writing then, I was a student. 
I was too busy. But I thought that is so interesting. I should have taken notes because when's that ever going to happen again? So think of an anecdote and you don't have to transition into it. You can just write it separately. You know, it's a charm and you're going to hook it onto your bracelet somehow, but you can do that in many different ways. Got about a minute and a half and I'll shush. Okay, I'm back. I hope you were able to write a little something or sketch something out. But before we leave the anecdote charm, I want to tell you about the fiction I chose to illustrate this. If you've read Deacon King Kong by James McBride, if you haven't, you should. It is fascinating. He writes a good story. Let me just say that. So many details. And the narrator for this story just it's one anecdote after another of all the people he knows and his part of brooklyn and it goes on and on and they all have funny nicknames and but it's anecdote after anecdote after anecdote and it's so fun to read and i would tell you you know from now on from this day forward travel with a little notebook you know, something to stick in your pocket and a pen or pencil or use your phone and write down these little anecdotes. Maybe just a few notes to help you remember them because they add so much humor or just detail to your piece. Oh, I had a whole screen for this. That was silly, Margaret. And okay, so I had these ideas. Was there an act of kindness? This was a, a prompt that I had in a workshop. Look out a window, interesting conversation. Did something surprise you? Did you meet an interesting person? Did you overhear an interesting quote or conversation? So I kind of told you about most of those, but that was the fancy slide I had. All right, so the, the memoir charm. This is the Kate May Ferry, only it's not. It's a fairy charm with a Kate May tag on it, but that's on my, my bracelet. All right. So, memoir. Memoir. The whole time I was in school to earn this MFA degree, my teachers would say to me, Margaret, you have to add more memoir. And I would say, I don't want to write memoir. I want to write interesting stories about things and places. No, but you have to add memoir. I don't wanna, you have to, I don't wanna. It went back and forth. And then finally it dawned on me, they don't mean for me to write a memoir from the time I was born till right now. They mean for me to put my own self and thoughts and whatever's into that essay, right? So for example, here's, Here's a story that happened. I wrote about Cape May Point. That's where I like to go to the beach. It's quiet there, Cape May Point State Park. And you, you can't go 
swimming because there's no lifeguard, but you can go in up to your knees. And it's just a wonderful place for people who like to read on the beach. Anyway, so I was sitting there one day with my book and looking at the beautiful water. And I noticed that there was a bird in distress. It was a rather large bird. I think it was a gannet. And there was a fisherman a few feet away from me, a bunch of feet away from me. And he was fishing. And I, I don't know if it was his line that the bird got tangled in or if it was just line that was in the water. I don't know, but he took responsibility, went up and he was trying to cut the, the string off of the poor bird. And out of nowhere, this man showed up and picked up the bird by the wings, held the wings out, and the fisherman was able to cut the fishing line off of the bird. And I thought, wow, that guy knew exactly what to do in that situation to help the fisherman help the bird. And I thought, you know, he looked at me, this man, and I thought at the time he was looking at me because I didn't think to do that. And then he disappeared. And I kept thinking, I was haunted by that. And it occurred to me, oh, that's exactly what my father would have done if he was here. And, and I kept thinking about it. And then I started getting all kinds of weird ideas. Was that my father come down from heaven to spy on me? And he used somebody else's person to do it. And that's why he looked at me. I just got these weird ideas. Ideas. So rather than just saying, I was at the beach and some guy helped a fisherman get the fishing line, I started thinking, oh my gosh, was that my father? It really occurred to me. It's not the kind of thoughts I usually have. I don't look at people and say, are you somebody I know come down from heaven to see what I'm doing? I, I never had that thought before, but this guy, you know, so similar to my father. Anyway, I wrote about it. I thought, that is something. What a weird thought to have. When I went to see the um, Johann Strauss II Museum, I wrote about how hard it was to find that place and how exhausted I was when I got to the museum. And, and it was a hot day and it was a busy part of town, which used to be the posh part of town and all this kind of stuff. But boy, I didn't think it was very posh when I was there. And here are my thoughts. So that's the kind of... That's the kind of thoughts that I now am incorporating into my, my, my essays. So I read about memoir and how to write it because maybe I'll add a paragraph here or there, or, you know, I'm comfortable with it now. I can write a bit longer about myself, but I'm still, I'm still not, the kind of person who's going to take selfies. I know many people, they put their life on social media and here's a selfie of me here and here's a selfie of me here. I just don't. If I see a reflective surface like here in Salzburg, okay, I'll take a picture of me. So I remember what I was wearing that day, but I really don't. So there, you know, there's the museum on the right. And there's no signs. You have to know where it is. You have to know the address. You have to know to walk in this little alley. You have to know to go up that stairway. And you have to know that the door with the eighth note on it is the Johann Strauss Museum, right? So it took me a while to figure out all that stuff. And there's the beautiful monument. Okay, so why not add a memoir charm to your narrative? We'll do another three minutes and just kind of write something about your feelings or or something personal about the situation that you're writing about maybe you had an epiphany somewhere maybe something happened that changed your way of thinking maybe you had feelings maybe you were exhausted and hot and you had this destination you really wanted to see or you were stressed out like me trying to climb up that that hike in uh, Montserrat. Consider your five senses. Did anything make an impression on you? Hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, seeing. I'm reminded of going to a book talk at a local bookstore 
it was on the porch because, you know, we're in a pandemic and somebody nearby was cooking hot dogs. And all I could think about was that I wanted a hot dog right then. The author wasn't talking, actually. They were just signing. So it wasn't like I was ignoring them. But Oh, those hot dogs. Or sometimes in the city you can smell, I don't eat nuts, but they roasted chestnuts or something. It's a lovely smell or tasting. Can you write about the Wildwood Boardwalk and not talk about tasting saltwater taffy or ice cream or french fries? I don't know. So you have about a minute and a half. If you just sketch out your idea, you don't have to actually write it in perfect sentences. Thirty seconds. Okay, time. So the funny thing about memoir, which my teachers tried to tell me and I didn't believe them until later, um, it has a, a way of slowing the movement down. So you're telling this story about a situation or a place and you're going along and then you need to put something in there to kind of slow it down for the reader, right? They don't want to go at a fast clip through your whole story. They wanted to slow down and speed up. And the memoir bits have a way of slowing the movement down, but also keep the reader's interest and move the story along. So it's doing the two of those at the same time, which is kind of cool, really. And okay, my teachers were right. I was wrong. The fiction example I have for this, a book that I finally got around to reading recently, a couple summers ago, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. It's set in the 19 teens in Brooklyn. It was published in, I think, the 40s. So the author, Betty Smith, put all it's a it's a novel but she put all this personal stuff in it that she experienced so this is like a chain of memoir bits all put together into a story but it's fiction so you never know how much of that is true but she couldn't have written in this detail if she didn't experience or someone close to her didn't experience these things so yeah it's a great one if you haven't read that that's another one i recommend to um book groups. Okay, so you have your charms, you have your bracelet, and you want to attach your charms. Draw arrows, use asterisks. Where would you put your anecdote charm in your narrative? Does it fit on a timeline or does it fit with something else you're talking about? Where would you put your memoir charm? Do you see any possibilities for research or culture charms in your bracelet? Remember me with Beethoven. Oh, I need to, I need to include Beethoven here. How am I going to do it? Research. And then would you feel comfortable sharing? I'm not going to stop. I'm not, uh, I am going to stop. I'm not going to stop us so you can write. I'm going to stop my talking and sharing 
so that we can have questions. A couple more slides though. This is the bracelet clasped, right? So think about once you have your story and stories all put together, can you join the front, meaning the beginning, to the end? Can you do that? Link the two. I try to get my students to do that. It's not always easy. I have some hints. Keep all your souvenirs, photos, travel journals, all that in a bag or box so that you can write in detail. That's for traveling, for any kind of writing. I like to keep all my notes in a dedicated notebook and label some of the pages with the kinds of charms and other stuff like notable people, scenes and places, surprises, revelations. And I do that for every project. I call them commonplace books. That's a whole other workshop. Anyway, I use this charm method a lot. They, they can stay separate, the charms, or they can be smoothed out in revision. Breaks are okay. Malcolm Gladwell will tell you that. It's okay to have breaks. You don't have to make everything smooth. And then here I am. I didn't put my picture there because I wanted to put a picture of my upcoming book. This is the tentative cover. I love it. It looks retro. And I told you about Nerd Traveler. I have a website and I share things there. And you can visit me there. There's my blue web link. It's just my name.com. You can sign up for my newsletter there. You can link to my writing. I have some samples there. And then Nerd Traveler, July 6th is the date. We'll see. The pandemic has wreaked havoc with printing and stuff, but we'll see. Read Furiously is my publisher. You can go to there.com or find it on Amazon once it's out. Um, there, you can't pre-order it yet, I don't think, So, but it's coming. So that's me. Visit my website. You'll see my email. and. Yeah, I can share these slides. I have a supplementary reading list that I can send you. So whatever, I'm happy to share. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Wait, I clicked the button. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you on screen. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been uh, really exciting. I hope uh, this has been helpful in getting people um, thinking differently about how they're telling their narratives and preparing it. Um, there's a demonstration about to pass me on the street, so I'm going to mute myself. But I wanted to ask again if anybody has any questions for Margaret or things that they want to, um, to share, please put those in the ask a question button below. Um, and if anybody does want to uh, share their reading, uh, or to, to read what they just worked on a little bit. Um, we can also do that if you wanna um, let, let us know in the chat, we can bring you up on screen. So take a sec, again, if you have any questions, please put those in there. I see you linked to all of the books I mentioned. Wow, look at that. That's fantastic. Librarians, I'll tell you. No questions? I'm always afraid that there's going to be a really hard question or something really personal or, I don't know, something I never thought of. So I'm, in a way, I'm relieved, but in a way, like, oh, come on, ask me something. Ask me about my book. It's going to have, I think, color pictures in it, which is a big deal. We learned that from Jane Friedman last night. Color pictures are a big deal. Any ephemera in my book? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a good example. See, this is one of those hard questions. I have to think of an example. But um, ephemera. For some reason, I'm thinking about that Montserrat trip where I didn't do the research that I should have done. And I ended up going in the gift shop and finding that book. And I also found, I don't know if this is really ephemera, but it doesn't make any sense with the trip, but I found a thimble. It's shaped like an owl 
It's just a cheesy thing. And it's got a badge on its front of the Black Madonna statue that I didn't get to see. And um, so I keep this near my computer because I use that as an example a lot when I'm speaking. But what does an owl have to do with Montserrat? I don't know. What does a thimble have to do with Montserrat? I don't know. And what, why would an owl be wearing a badge of a medieval statue on his chest? I don't know. So to me, this is ephemera because it's going to detach itself from my Barcelona souvenirs. But in that sense, it's ephemera. But it was important to me then because it, it reminds me, do your research, dummy. Anyway. I uh, I was a thimble collector in my youth, so I, I support that as a, as a good souvenir. <laughs> um, we did have a, a comment also from Kristen from the audience uh, saying this has been wonderful and she's definitely going to use the charm bracelet idea going oh, forward, good. so thank you. Um, it it might just work like a prompt or it might be the form that you'll use, I don't know. I think it's always valuable um, to to even just approach something that you're doing every day if you're a writer and you're working on these things, but just from a different angle yep. and um, and thinking about how you can how you can change the way that you might the, the first thought you have about presenting information. So I think that's wonderful. All right. So last last chance if there are any questions. Otherwise, um, do you have any uh, any last parting wisdom for us, Marvin? Oh, I worked it into my my presentation <laughs> the, the whole idea of commonplace books i have one for everything and the the thing that works with those like okay you write all your information in there all your inspirations everything else your notes of that you eavesdropped from a table next to you in a restaurant whatever it is or the person on the train and you have to look at it it's not going to gel by itself you have to read that thing often so before you start writing Take a look through that notebook full of stuff and connections start happening between the different ideas. And it, it never, never fails to amaze me. Thank you, Jessica. I'm glad you came. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and again, thank you all for participating so far in our local author day weekend. Um, it's an event that we love and um, we're glad we're able to do it virtually um, and that Margaret was able to join us virtually. Um, if you haven't yet visited our um, our author fair, please do that. Um, you'll find a page for Margaret and you can um, access her website and um, the link for her book as well as for our other presenters and authors this weekend. Um, and we do have one more um, presentation this afternoon from Karen Miller on authorpreneurship as well as one more Zoom networking hour. Um, you can find links to access all of those um, below me at the access all local author day events here button so please click that thank you again margaret um, thank you it's really been wonderful and enjoy it's been a pleasure